Hallelujah. Those who have your Bibles, please stand to your feet. We're going to the to Proverbs, the 18th chapter. Proverbs, the 18th chapter. We're going to hit two separate um, scriptures on the day. Proverbs, the 18th chapter. We're going to go to verse 19. Proverbs, the 18th chapter, verse 19. When you have it, let me know. Pull out your electronic vices. Okay, I'm going to go. And it reads, A brother offended is harder to be won than a strong city. And their contention are like the bars of a castle. Now go to me with my second scripture. Genesis chapter 45. Genesis chapter 45. Anybody need help finding Genesis? I just want to know who I want to invite to Bible study. I'll give you a special invitation. <laughs> Genesis chapter 45. We're going to begin reading at verse 5. And it reads... Then Joseph could not refrain himself before all them that stood by him. Genesis 45? No, verse 1 through 5. Oh, I'm sorry. All right. All right. That means y'all some good listeners. That, that's what that means. Verse 1. Then Joseph could not refrain himself before all them that stood by him. And he cried. Cause every cause every man to go out before me. This is Joseph talking. He said, everybody clear the room. That's what he said. And there stood no man with him. Joseph was by himself. It says, while Joseph made himself known to his brethren. And he wept aloud. And the Egyptians, these are the ones that were with him that he cleared the room. And the Egyptians... And the house of Pharaoh heard. So they heard Joseph crying from on the outside. And Joseph said to his brethren, I am Joseph. Doeth my father yet live? And then Joseph's brethren could not answer him. For they were troubled at his presence. And Joseph said to his brethren, Come near to me. I pray you. And they came near. And he said, I am Joseph, your brother, whom ye sold into Egypt. Now therefore, be not grieved nor angry with yourselves that ye sold me hither. For God did send me before you to preserve life. The word of the Lord is already blessed. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we magnify you, we lift you up, we glorify you. God, we thank you for your word on today. We thank you for every listener. God, as usual, breathe on me, your servant, as you've already breathed on your word. God, open our ears and eyes of understanding. Father, open our hearts. Father, show us your way. Teach us your truth. And Father, right now, we come against anything that might want to steal or distract your word. Father, we thank you for the results. We thank you for changed lives. In Jesus' name, we pray and all God's children said amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank God for his word on today. I was um, at home and, and this morning, as I was preparing to come to church, I ran out the door and left. I had these three fans. Y'all remember the church fans? Well, I had these three fans, and on these three fans stood the words, Amen. I meant to bring my Amens with me, because I don't expect any today. <laughs> and look, I'm okay. I'm okay. I, 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 I'll just um, think about the Amens. 
Um, our title for today is Offended to Preserve Life. Offended to Preserve Life. Offended to Preserve Life. And if you notice, that, that was the last thing that Joseph said in verse 5. He told his brother and he said, he said, you know, therefore be not grieved. Don't be angry with yourselves. That don't be mad for what you did to me is what he was saying. He's saying, for God did send me before you to preserve life. Um, in our text, let's lay a little groundwork before we get to our, our, our main subject. Um, God is about relationships. We are relational beings. Why are we relational beings? Because we were created in the image and in the likeness of our heavenly father. Um, father, son, Holy Spirit. Three distinct anointings and spirits that act as one. God wanted man to be relational as well. That's why in the book of Genesis in the garden, when Adam was there and he was naming the animals, um, God said that it's not good that man should be alone. He said that because Adam needed somebody. God says when he put us together, when he built us, he made us to connect to one another. Y'all notice how I slid that, slid that connect in there? <laughs> you know, y'all know our theme this year is connect. Um, last, last Sunday I had on my Connect shirt. It was designed by Bonnie. Go ahead, Bonnie. That's, that's the shameless plug. And then I wore the other Connect shirt on Wednesday. Y'all should come to Bible study. It's a fabulous shirt. <laughs> um, but God made for us to connect to one another. He never meant for us to be silos. He never meant for us to be standalone beings. We need one another especially in the body of Christ. If the body of Christ can't be together, it's a problem. How can we be the light of the world? How can we be um, a, 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 the moral compass of the world if we're not together? Now, most people think that together means that we agree, agree all along. Mm -mm. We have distinct personalities, distinct giftings, distinct anointings. But, but sometimes when we don't get along, it turns into this thing that's authored and, 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 and inspired by the enemy. And it's called the spirit of offense. That's what we're going to talk about today, y'all. The spirit of offense. That's the reason our title is offended to preserve life now um, everyone in here including yours truly has had the spirit of offense at one time or another see some of y'all silent because you still got the spirit of offense I'm telling you and so right now um, the goal of today is to deal with offense how should the body deal with offense um, because people get offended and families break up. People get offended. They leave church. The spirit of offense is nothing but a distraction from the enemy. God made us to connect to one another. And anything that God wants to put together, the devil wants to tear apart. Amen to somebody. Somebody. What is the spirit of offense? The spirit of offense is a perceived violation or attack of wrongdoing which results in hurt, anger, bitterness, and or resentment. Who's in here have been offended? <laughs> the spirit of offense is a perceived violation or attack of wrongdoing which results in hurt, Anger, bitterness, resentment, and I'm going to add one more, which I didn't, disappointment. It rises up whenever there's a perceived attack of wrong going on that's done against you. 
And my goal today is to deliver God's people from the spirit of offense. I promise if you receive these truths on today, you can be delivered. Your relay, whoever has offended you, you'll be able to 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 put it in perspective. Um, who, no matter whether they meant to do it or not, because <laughs> sometimes people offend you on purpose. Sometimes people really do are out to get you. <laughs> you notice I said sometimes. Other times it's us being in our feelings. The spirit of offense was never meant to stay with man. I'm telling you, you know, hurt, anger, disappointment. These are, are the foreground. These are the first reactions to the spirit of offense. And offense, most of the time, can happen, but it doesn't have to turn into the a spirit of offense. The reason that a spirit of offense occurs is because the individual has had time to think about it. And the offense generally will occur from somebody you at least expected it to come from. I didn't expect my children to treat me that way. I didn't expect um, my wife or my husband to say that to me. Look, I didn't expect to be treated like that at church. The offense usually comes from some place that's close to you. Do you realize it's the devil's goal to mess up your God ordained relationships? The reason I say God ordained, that means the, the offense may likely come from somebody that was, has a place in your purpose or your destiny. Those are the ones. And they, you want to know how I know? Because offense wouldn't hurt so bad if it didn't come from somebody you trusted. Relationship was established. If there was no relationship, it'd roll off you like a water off a duck's back. In, in, in my family, um, now y'all may think we're strange for what I'm about to tell you, but don't judge me. In my family, amongst my siblings and my cousins, we talk about each other's mother. Oh, yes, we do. It's been that way since I was, uh, I, I can't remember. I don't know, sometimes, um, you know, my cousin Tasha, our mouth like, uh, and she'll, she'll be like, and then normally it's like split seconds, so nobody saw it but her. And she'll say, well, I'll say your mother. Then she'll say your mother, too. I said, well, my mother's deceased, so you can't talk about my mother. And then so we have these mother jokes going on back and forth. It's, it's a Clopton thing, y'all. Some of y'all might be sensitive, but, but that's how that's that's just who we are. But let you say my mama. <laughs> it's going to be a problem. <laughs> Offense is based on the relationship. <laughs> Offense is based on the fact it shouldn't have come from you, whatever happened. I'm telling you, um, you know, the spirit of offense, when it comes in and we've had time to think about it, then it's like a cancer, a slow cancer. And it just sits there and it begins to fester and you begin to think about it and then it grows because remember of real true offense the spirit of offense occurs because of time so the more that it grows the more it takes over that spirit of offense and do you know offense occurs more in the body of Christ than outside the body of Christ it happens in the church. I'm not talking about just this church, every church, any place there's, because people say, well, I didn't expect it from you, or you're not supposed to act like that towards me. 
the spirit of offense. And then next, you know, the, you're coming in and the person that the, the offense occurred from, you're walking down the aisle, they see you and they walk down the other aisle. Or they see you and then they pretend they didn't see you. You know, you don't, y'all, y'all, y'all funny because y'all acting like that you've never experienced this. But sure as the Pope is Catholic, you have experienced what I'm talking about. <laughs> look, it, look, it happens in marriages. If a husband and wife have been bumping heads and then, you know, now they haven't talked to each other for a couple of hours and, you know, once some, and somebody goes somewhere and the other person will send them a text and you wait extra long to respond to that text <laughs> so that they know that you're still upset about whatever you guys bumped heads about. In families, when, when, when siblings bump head and there's that offense occurs, um, they're not going to call each other for a period of time. You may not see each other till the next family event because of the spirit of offense. I told you that the devil is about tearing up what God has put together and however he can do it and whoever he can use to do it he's going to I'm telling you um because when it comes to offense you know I'm gonna tell you some ways how it can happen it can happen because there was a mistake against us it can happen because there's malice against us it can happen when you have unfulfilled expectations of others and they do something to you that you thought that they would never do I'm telling you, dealing with this spirit of offense has become common to our human experience. You know, we, we've normalized that, that, okay, I'm offended. And then we walk around with it and we think it's normal when it's not. It's dysfunctional if you're walking around with the spirit of offense. Because that means that you have some things in you that you have never resolved or dealt with. And here's the, here's, the, here's the part about it. Do you realize if you've never dealt with it, it's going to occur again with somebody else other than the person who did it the first time? God has designed a plan in his word so that oh, when offense occurs, because the fence is going to happen. It's going to happen. There's no way around it. It's, it's, it, it. it's going to happen. But if you don't have a plan in place when it happens, you're going to fall for the okie doke over and over and over again. And then next to you, you're going to be one of those people nobody wants to be around. You, you become part of a click slash gang because offended people find other offended people. Y'all silent today, huh? I knew I shouldn't have went back for those amens. <laughs> I told you earlier, you can be offended without developing the spirit of offense. And if we would learn to take the expectations off of people, you know, well, well I hold you to this standard in my life. And so anything that you do, um, that, that's wrong and, and it, it's going to affect me and it's going to devastate me. Um, God says, take the expectations off of people and put the expectations on yourself. Amen. I'm telling you. The, the, the spirit of offense, I told you, it requires an emotional investment. And I'm telling you, when every time the enemy knows that when we're in our feelings, that's the best time to send somebody to offend you. And I'm telling you, the spirit of offense is a major cause of most fractured relationships. Um, now that you have the spirit of offense, let me tell you some things that that will happen when you this is how you know you have the spirit of offense. You um, begin to entertain derogatory elements from outside of the relationship that you were in with the offender. You begin to minimize 
the benefits of being in relationship with the offender. Look, look, you begin to redefine people who are friends as enemies. Do I need to repeat that? This is how you know that you are walking around with the spirit of offense as a believer. You begin to entertain derogatory elements from outside of a relationship, meaning anything that surrounds that person, you begin to entertain that stuff. You begin to think about it. Then it says you begin to minimize the benefits that you experience from being in relationship. You're like, I don't need them in my life. <laughs> Knowing there are benefits with having them in your life. And then you begin to redefine people who are friends as enemy. I'm telling you, you better hear me. Holding on to stuff like bitterness, cultivating grudges, hurt, pain, and disappointment. If you don't properly handle these hurts, I'm telling you, it can come out against somebody else later. You're going to cause a casualty of war because you're holding stuff on the inside. I'm telling you, whenever an offense occurs and it's internalized, there is this sense that we all have um, known as payback. <laughs> Come on, you know you want some payback. You're not happy until they get what you think they have coming. You're not satisfied until they hurt like you hurt. Possibly a little bit worse. <laughs> Look, but there, there's a, um, I'm going to give you the remedy to all the spirit of offense. Forgiveness. <laughs> Forgiveness cancels out the outstanding debt. I'm telling you because when I forgive, what do I do? I save myself from the spirit of offense. I said it um, last year when I talked about forgiveness. Forgiveness does not necessarily mean reconciliation. Because um, just because I forgive you doesn't mean I have to let you back in where you were. That's something that we have to work out and both parties have to agree to it. It can't just be you. Well, we back to the same place. No, you can't tell me where you belong in my life. It's up to me to decide where you belong in my life. But it does mean that when I see you, I can work with you. We can handle the business of that hand. I don't have to be out to get you. You don't have to be out to get me. What, what it means is that we've put that thing behind us and we can be civil as believers. Amen. Amen. Now, what does all this have to do with, the, with our, our, our text on today? Well, everybody knows the story of Joseph. Everybody know Joseph, right? Y'all know Joseph's daddy. Who's his daddy? <laughs> Bible studies at 7 p.m. on Wednesday and 11 also if you're free during the day. Y'all know Joseph? He had the coat of many colors. His daddy was, say it again, David, Jacob, also known as Israel. Well, and Joseph, I, oh, I am. That's the goal today. We're going to teach this. We're going to walk this. I promise if you listen and take good notes, I promise you'll be blessed. Yeah. Come on. We, we know the story of Joseph. We're very familiar with it, how he was sold into slavery by his brothers. Yeah. Remember, Joseph was not the youngest son, but he was the second to youngest son of Jacob. And he was hated by his brothers because he was his daddy's favorite son. So what they did is they sold him into slavery. But you know, it didn't start out as being sold. It started out, they were going to kill him. They, they, they threw him in a pit. The brothers got together and they said, we're going to kill him. But the brother Judah, y'all know Judah. What does Judah mean? Praise. Praise. 
Judah saved his life. Judah said, no, we can't kill him. But Judah didn't want to get in trouble with the others. So he said, because they might kill me too. So he said, let's not kill him. Let's just sell him. So they took Joseph and they sold him to travelers. He was sold into travelers on their way to Egypt. And then what they did is they told the father that Joseph was killed by a wild animal. So they lied to the father. They sold Joseph. Joseph not only did he get sold, he got sold a second time. That's how he wound up at Potiphar's house. Then while in Potiphar's house, um, Potiphar's wife, you know what she wanted to do to him, right? The, the young folks call it smashing. <laughs> and Joseph wouldn't do it. Joseph said, I'm running for my life. And Joseph, he got caught up. That was the first sexual harassment lawsuit. And he got caught and went to jail. And then while he was in jail, he um, sat there and there was a quite possibility that he was going to get out sooner. And he told the guys that were in jail that got out before him, he said, just remember me when you get out. They left him in there. They forgot about him. And eventually, Joseph got out and he wound up being the second man in control of Egypt. There was Pharaoh and then there was Joseph. Now all those things, I just gave you the short versions of, of everything that his brothers did to him. They sold, first they were gonna kill him. They lied to the daddy. Can you imagine the, the emotional fit that his father went through? Knowing that his favorite son, his favorite son has just been killed by a wild animal. So the father's grieving, mourning, then all of a sudden, not, not only did you um, plan to kill me, now you made some money off of me because you sold me out. I got charged as, as, as a rapist. This is Joseph. He was charged as a rapist. Then I wound up in jail. Then, by the grace of God, he wound up being the second man in control in Egypt. And that's where we find ourself on today this is where our text begins and in, in the book of Genesis and I told you in that 45th chapter said then Joseph um, his brothers and his father there was a famine that occurred and so they had to leave where they were and they had to go to Egypt and when they went to Egypt remember they had to go there for supplies because there was a famine and a drought where they were and who should they wind up in front of? <laughs> but the brother that they sold out. They stood before him. Now, now remember, they saw him and it's been a rough period of 22 years. And they did not recognize who he was. But he knew who they were the minute they walked in. How many people can recognize their offenders a mile away? I know that walk. I know. Uh, did, is that the voice? I know. I knew that was. <laughs> Twenty-two years has passed by, and now you need me. Twenty-two years has passed by, and now you you standing in front of me, and I run this. <laughs> I hold your fate in my hand. 22 years later, this is what happened. And as they're standing before Joseph, remember, Joseph, he said, it's me, Joseph. They were silent like y'all are. <laughs> and after he said, it's me, Joseph, then he said, clear the room. Everybody from Egypt needed to clear the room. They needed to go elsewhere. And it said that's when Joseph began to cry out and he began to weep. And he said it again, it's me, Joseph, your brother who you sold out. 
I'm the one you did that stuff to. And the ones on the outside, can you imagine the Egyptians like, what's going on behind that door? That they got him crying. Can you imagine they want to bust in and go upside? Well, I don't know what you did to him, but you're going to pay the day. We don't know. We don't know, but it's a problem up in here. And Joseph's crying out, it's me. And as he's looking at them, can you imagine they were terrified? They're sitting up there, just like he having flashback, they're having flashback. <laughs> they're realizing, this ain't just my brother. This is my brother who's the second in control of all of Egypt. This is my brother who's the prime minister. This is my brother who's holding my fate in his hand. Look, we lied and told daddy that he was dead. We might die for real today. <laughs> Y'all remember what they did to him? They planned on killing him. They wound up selling him. They lied to the father. Look, they wound, he wound up being sold again, was accused of rape, wound up in jail. Look, I'm told you, look, you might expect that from an enemy, but you don't expect that from somebody that's close to you. You don't expect folks in church to talk about you behind your back. To mean mug you and to look funny behind. <laughs> Lady Kyra, guess what? I heard Shan, Shan Smith. <laughs> You don't expect that from those. You don't expect those close to you to hurt you. You don't expect those close to you to look to cause that spirit of bitterness. I told you, Joseph has had 22 years to think about everything that his brothers did to him. Can you imagine sometime during that 22 year period? Joseph was like, I can't wait till I if they ever run across my. If, Oh, you going to get it today. <laughs> For 22 years, this thing has had a chance to ferment and fester. Act like a can. He's, he's playing it over in his head. See, but what did I say it takes the spirit of offense? How does it occur? When you begin to think about that thing and you're playing it over and over and over. In our text, it says that when they saw that it was Joseph and they were afraid, they're freaking out. Joseph said, don't be scared. He said, it's me, Joseph. He's, and he meant it. Do you want to know why he meant it? Look where he was. He knows what they tried to do. They know what they tried to do. But look where he was. J Joseph said, you don't have to be afraid. He said, I'm over it. <laughs> it's done and over with. I'm through. Uh -uh. I, I ain't even mad at you. No, do you, you ain't got nothing to worry about. He, look, he said, he said, he said, stop tripping. Stop tripping. He said, don't even trip over it. No, it's all good. God worked it all out. How do you think Joseph was able to have that attitude from a genuine place? Knowing what they did. Do you realize the whole time Joseph was never caught up on what they did, but he was caught up on his God? See, see, this, this, is, this is how, remember I told you that Joseph's brothers sold him and he wound up at Potiphar's house? I didn't tell y'all that Joseph ran Potiphar's house as a slave. He, he, ran the, he ran it, he ran it. Joseph was the man. It was his wife that jacked that one up. But even when Joseph went to jail, Joseph ran to jail. Every place that Joseph went, God had his hand on him. Do you realize you don't have to be mad with your offenders 
if God has his hand on you, you're going to be blessed every place that you go, every time, because people cannot affect your future. They can't mess with your destiny. Your life is in God's hands, not a man's. When God has laid some stuff out for you, you're going to prosper no matter what. That's the trick of the devil for you to be concentrating on a person and playing stuff over in your head. Those are distractions from purpose. God meant for us to be together. God really did want Joseph to be with his brothers. The brothers messed it up, not Joseph. God didn't cause the breach. That was a choice made by a man, the brothers. They got together and acted crazy. And during this whole time, Joseph could, he was offended. He was hurt knowing that his brothers sold him out, lied on him, set him up for failure, scandalized his name from people that it shouldn't have come from. But Joseph said, yeah, they did it. But it don't matter in the big scheme of things. He told his brothers when he saw him, he said, I'm, you're standing in front of me. He said, don't, don't trip, y'all. I'm good. <laughs> I'm good. And when he saw his brothers, they were terrified. Because they thinking, um, what you mean, you good? <laughs> Remember, they ain't seen him for 22 years. So they don't. They don't know what Joseph's heart is like. Do you realize your offenders don't know your heart? <laughs> they don't know your heart. They think, you know, you're going you're gonna to get me back. If not today, it's going to be tomorrow. <laughs> They're sitting there in, in front of Joseph. And according to the text, it said when Joseph said, don't trip. You ain't, you ain't got nothing to be afraid of. He said, come closer to me. It did. You did. Do I got to read it again? <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> it, it, look, look, look. It, it, it's, look. Joseph said to his brother in verse 4, come near to me. <laughs> Can you imagine? You got a nerve thinking I'm going to come closer to you. <laughs> Knowing what I did to you and you know that I know that you know. Joseph was saying, come closer from uh, being genuine because he said, I want to alleviate your worries. He said, look, but the whole time they're not trusting Joseph. The whole time they're afraid. They're leery of Joseph. Joseph, when he was talking to them, no matter what he said to them, they still got their guards up like, oh, yeah, well, I'm waiting on him to lower the boom. It's coming. They did something to him, but now they're tortured over what they did. Do you realize when people intend to offend you nine times out of ten, they're more tortured than what they, over what they did than you are? Joseph, what he did, this is how you know that God was involved in this thing for Joseph. Um... My, 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 make, my point that I want to make right here is one that I promise that if you get it, you will be blessed. Why do you think Joseph told the people, clear the room? Hmm. Why, why do you think? My, my first principle is when you're hurt, you got to watch who you share with regarding your hurt. Joseph cleared the room because Joseph had forgiven his brothers. What did I tell you Joseph's role in the kingdom was? He was the prime minister, second man in charge. Joseph knew that if I don't get y'all, they going to get y'all. Joseph had wisdom enough to know that I can't share with them what y'all did to me. Somebody, if you catch that. 
God wants to heal. But the problem is you walking around telling everybody except for the person you, that's the offensive with. There's this sick thing going on on the inside, this sick spirit of offense, this demon on the inside that you're feeding because you want to turn everybody against the one that's offended, that you offended. You want to tell everybody, get people on your side. But if you look at Joseph's example, he cleared the room because everybody else didn't have anything to do with what was going on between him and his brothers. We need to watch who we're telling our business to, who we're talking about others to, because it has nothing to do with you really trying to fix the relationship. It has nothing to do with it. Um, I, I brought scripture, y'all. I brought plenty of scripture because we got to balance this thing out. Am I saying that you can't ever talk to somebody? No. What I'm saying is you need to choose who you talk to because the person that you talk to should be one who's going to help you process this thing. Not the one that's, good. look, I'm hurting, you hurt, so we're going to be hurt together. If you go to Matthew, the 18th chapter, verses 15 through 17, it's, this is scripture, and it says, moreover, this is how you, if your brother shall trespass against, if your brother did something to you, is what it said, go and tell them, tell him his fault between him and you alone. This is scripture, Matthew 18, 15 through 17. And it says, between him and you, and if he hears you, if he's willing to work it out, if, 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 then you've gained your brother. Verse 16, it says, but if he's not going to hear you, then you go get somebody else. He said, but if he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or more, one or two or more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. And then verse 17, if he shall neglect to hear you and them, mm, tell it unto the church. What? That means you got to bust them out because they acting a fool and acting wrong. You got to bust them out because they don't want to do the right thing and act the right way. You got to bust them out before the church because they're being messy. Y'all know I didn't write that. It was in the book. It was in the book before I even got here. He said, but if he neglected here, the church, let him, <laughs> let him be unto thee as a heathen man and a publican. In other words, you got to leave foolish people to their foolish ways. If your goal and purpose is to restore the relationship, which is what I'm talking about, God says offenses will come. Um, but at, as we deal with offenses, we got to deal with the offense from a place of hurt. Do you realize that if you're going to deal with an offense it ha and, and, and forgive, it has to be done intentionally and not out of emotion it has to be an intentional act it has to be deliberate meaning that if I really made up my mind that I'm going to work this out that means when the other feelings arise and they occur that I'm not going to go along with those feelings when I get the urge to go blast you to, to so and so and to so and so and so I'm not going to do that because I want to deliberately save the relationship I'm not going to bring other people in. Do you realize? Because most, most of us, and we're all guilty of this, we want to tell somebody because we want people on our side. Yeah. And then, look, and then we have the nerve, the gall, the utter audacity to get mad at folks who won't get, be mad at them because we're mad at them. <laughs> you're not my friend anymore because you're still their friend. Well, they didn't do to me what they did to you. <laughs> I don't control your life just like you don't control mine. The spirit of offense is real, y'all, and it occurs all the time. It's from the enemy that we walk around in our feelings. I'm telling you, look, if you have to tell it, let it be because you need somebody's wisdom. 
in order to help you to work through and to process the situation, I told you, and not because you want them on your side or to turn against. Look, a lot of people, I told you, they tell because they're looking for somebody to agree with them. Um, they do it because they want to punish the offender. I want to punish you. I want you to, 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 I want you to feel hurt. I told you, um, Jesus said, I told you during the model prayer, what did Jesus say during the model prayer? He, he, he said, um, he said, Father, forgive us of our trespasses as we forgive others. In other words, Jesus was saying, God, treat us the same way that we treat others when it comes to forgiveness. <laughs> Y'all going to make me come down. God, I want you to treat me the same way that I treat others when it comes to forgiveness. God, if I forgive them quickly, then you forgive me quickly. God, if I'm messy about my forgiveness and my forgiveness ain't genuine and it's for show and not from my heart. God, I want you to treat me the same way. I'm going to let that sit there for a minute. <laughs> the Bible says the same way that you meet it out is what's going to come back to you. If you getting back a lot of certain kind of stuff, what did you say? <laughs> You're putting it out there according to Sister Jean. <laughs> she said, in other words, yo, look, um, did, didn't Malcolm X say, your pigeon's coming home to roost? <laughs> We have an obligation and a responsibility as believers to not set up the spirit of offense. When it try, come to try and move in, when it try to come in and, and do what it wants to do, we're supposed to say, no, nah, here's your eviction notice. Yeah, they, they did mean to do it, but I'm not going to sit here and play with this thing. I'm going to forgive. I'm telling you. Um, if we don't want God to treat us like we treat others, then we need to change some stuff. Because how many people in here know that God knows enough to bury you? <laughs> God knows enough to bury you. God knows. No, he knows. He was sitting there watching when you, now you fill in the blank. <laughs> when you said it, when you heard it, when you did it, when you thought about it, God was sitting there. Hallelujah. Some of y'all need to stop playing. Yeah, come on, man. <laughs> In corporate America, we used to, um, I used to issue out these NDAs. And, you know, that's an acronym for non-disclosure agreement. God has some NDAs in place. God doesn't tell our business. God, look, God loves us so much and he wants us to work it out. Can you imagine if God said, well, um, you talk a lot, so I'm going to tell yours. I'm going to rip this NDA out. God says, I, I, look, he has enough to bury us. God's got the lowdown on us. But despite having the lowdown, he still lifts us up. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. People hate us on speculation, but God knows the truth and still loves us. Amen. Come on, people hate, they can make up some stuff. Hallelujah. Look, is there anybody here that, that, look, can take a moment and give God praise about the stuff that he didn't tell, the stuff he covered up, the stuff he kept under wraps? The stuff he didn't leak out. The stuff he didn't hold against us. Hallelujah. Okay, let me take it a farther. Um, can you give God some praise for the stuff that did get out, but he cut it off? <laughs> he didn't allow us to reap the damage from the stuff that was out there. I'm telling you. Look, he didn't let it go too far. And in some cases, it got out, but he made it seem like it was a rumor. <laughs> I told you God knows our secrets, our thoughts, our flaws. He knows our dysfunctional ways. He knows our shortcomings, our habits, our addictions, our proclivities. Look, 
God knows our secrets and our issues. But he loves us regardless to and in spite of. Why can't we have that kind of love for one another as the body of Christ? I'm telling you. Stop putting folks on blast if you don't want God to do it for you. Stop telling other folks shortcomings and their, their issues if you don't want God to do it for you because he has the ability. Hallelujah. Real quick, number two, my number two. Look, look, don't intimidate because of your position. Amen. Joseph stood before his brothers as the prime ministers. Joe, they come in for him. Their future is in his hand. As he's sitting up there, he told them, come closer to me. He wanted to reestablish relationship. Now, he could have had those guys on the outside come in and kill everybody. Kill their thoughts. He, could, he had the influence. Look, he didn't even have to say nothing. All he had to do was look at them, you know, give them the sign. But Joseph didn't do any of that. He put them out the room and he said, come closer. Because I care about you. I want, it, I want the closeness to you. I need you to feel like I feel. I need you to understand that I'm not bitter. I'm not angry. I'm not upset with you. Because look, at the end of the day, God allowed it to happen. And if God allowed it to happen, that means there's a purpose in it. There's, there's something for me to learn, something for me to grow, some way for me to make better, some way for me to build up God's kingdom. Joseph said, I'm not tripping. I want to establish relationship. Y'all my brothers. Y'all haven't been acting like it. In order, here's the number two, I mean, another part is number two. In order for true reconciliation and, and, and forgiveness to occur, you got to acknowledge what was done. No, no hold, let me make it clear. The brothers didn't have to acknowledge it. Joseph did, had to acknowledge. Because sometimes in church, we mess folks up because we expect believers and other Christians to pretend that something didn't happen and it really did. In order for you to heal from a situation, you need to acknowledge that this happened. Joseph, I'm going to tell you, if you look at what he said carefully, Joseph said, I am Joseph, your brother, who you sold into slavery. He said, what was he saying? He said, I'm Joseph. In other words, what you did don't change who I am. <laughs> I'm Joseph. Then he said, I'm, I'm your brother. I'm still your brother. But he said, but you did this to me. I need you to understand whether you acknowledge it, whether you agree with it. You did this to me. I, I want you to know that I know that you did this to me. I want you to know that I, that I know that you did it on purpose. You can get healed from a situation if you would stop pretending that it didn't happen, and it did. If you can be honest with yourself, you did do this. You did sell me out. You did mess up my reputation. You did lie on me. You didn't protect me. You assassinated my character. You did this. I want you to know that I know that you did this. I'm not going to walk around and phony kick it knowing that it's on the inside of me and I've never spoken to you about it. You need to know why I'm upset with you. You did this. He said that to his brothers. He said, I'm not doing this for you. I'm doing it for me. I need to get this off my chest so I can move on. That's what he was doing there. He said, I'm your Joseph, your brother, whom you sold out. He wasn't pretending. I told you sometimes folks in church, they act like that you can't have a life or have issues going on. And that you all every day is a day of Thanksgiving. Yes, it is. But sometimes I don't feel like celebrating the day. <laughs> I'm hurt today. So look, stop talking about what's wrong with them. No, look, know that it took everything that that in me possible to make it out of bed so I can get here and change my attitude. Thank God that I came here so that I could get changed. Joseph did not use his position to intimidate his brothers. He was, he was saying, we're going to be real about this as brothers. I'm not using my position. 
I'm not using who I am. I'm taking the title off there so we can address this. Am I talking to anybody? Third point, so I can, so I can get y'all out of here. <laughs> um, in order to truly deal with the spirit of offense, forgiveness has to be intentional and not emotional. Because some people can say, I forgive you. Stop lying. You don't forgive me. You're just going through the motions. It has to be intentional. It, you can't just tell me. You got to show me. It has, you got to show me it. And you can't, it's not a one-time occurrence. It's a process. Just like destroying the relationship, it can happen next quick. But building, restoring trust is going to take time. And, and we both have to be prepared to deal with the fact that it's going to take time. It has to be intentional. Because there's going to be some stuff in, the, in days that are going to occur that you're not one going to do it. But, you, but if it's intentional and you're deliberate about this thing, you have to be deliberate. If you're deliberate, I promise you, um, you can work through and that spirit of offense can't set up a camp and can't make itself at home. Hallelujah. Um, the, if you look at verse four, look at verse four for me real quick. In verse four, it says, and Joseph said to his brother, come near to me, I pray thee. And they came near and he said, I'm Joseph, your brother, whom ye sold into Egypt. And it's, then he go to five and says, now, therefore, don't be grieved nor angry with yourselves that you sold me hither. For God did send me to preserve life. If you look at the 50th chapter and I'm going to summarize it because we call this cutting across the field. <laughs> In the 50th chapter, um, they brought the father to where Joseph is, and then the father died. In other words, they lived in Egypt for a period of, and then the father died. And the brothers, when they went to Joseph, they looked at him. They had that same look that they had the first time when they saw Joseph. They're like, oh, he just stayed off us because daddy was alive. <laughs> now that daddy's dead, it's a rat now. We, oh, he's about to get us now. And that's when Joseph said, he said, I'm still the same Joseph that forgave you. He says, look, look, still don't be afraid. Don't trip. Don't freak out. He said, because the thing that you meant for evil. <laughs> he said, the thing that you meant for evil. Now, most people want to jump to that second part, but we got to say this evil for just a second. That word meant, you know, it really means orchestrated. You set it up. You put all the pieces in place. You did this. The thing that you orchestrated. You know, Joseph was telling them, you orchestrated it, but God was the conductor of the orchestra. <laughs> he said, God was working this thing out. He said, you orchestrated, you plotted against me, you meant evil, you tried to hurt me on purpose. Look, look. I'm telling some, some of y'all quiet right now, but you can't pretend if you want real deliverance. He said, what, did, what you meant for evil, he said, God turned it out for my good. Now, what he meant, he said, he said, people can do stuff to you and they can map it out. But what Joseph was saying, yeah, that can do that. They can do that. But God can turn it around. God can get in the middle of their evil plan and switch a few pieces around and make it into good. God can turn hurt into victory. God can turn pain into joy. Hallelujah. Look, and Joseph said, I can't be mad at y'all. You see what God has done? No, you got to catch this. When the people that tried to do you and then you survived what they tried to do to you. And you're actually better? Come on, y'all. They tried it and it didn't work out. And you're better. You're smiling. You're healthier. They said you wouldn't be, but now you got the education, the business, the family, the home, the car, the da-da-da, the joy. You're happy. You're in a better place. I can't be mad at you. Look at what God has done. Look at how he blessed me in spite of, regardless too. No matter what you did, God, God allowed it so that I could get to where I am. 
Joseph, he said, look, I was offended, but the offense had to come so that I could be a blessing. Somebody give God a hand, praise. I know it was long. I still didn't cover 90% of the stuff. But I promise that if you would change your perspective when it comes to offense, that you and others can be delivered. You don't have to be angry or hurt or playing stuff or, or trying to play people or telling and talking. Go to the individual and fix it yourself. Then if you can't fix it, then you bring in an unbiased individual. Then if, if, they, if they're not here trying to hear the unbiased individuals, you bring it, when they say before the church, that means the elders of the church. Those that are spiritually mature. Not, not just any or anybody, not the gossip mongers, not the talkers, not the special people. Y'all know who they are. And then if that person is going to still do what they do, you got to leave them be. You're special. We gave you a chance to fix it. You didn't want to fix it. So now we're going to leave you to your own devices. And however it turned out between you and God, that's y'all business. Let us stand.